this planet. And during that entire time, one fact was undeniably true. The earth was big, we were small. Whatever we did, we could grow our numbers, we'd expand our footprint, we could clear more forest, we could leave more waste behind, we could consume more resources. By and large, until very recently, the planet basically didn't notice. Our activities were pretty tiny. And so the strategies of our ancient ancestors of using more resources, not worrying about waste, growing, spreading out, inventing new technologies, and doing it again and again and again, was a very, very viable strategy for success as a species for millions of years. But only until modern human history, and especially the last couple of hundred years, and maybe just the last 50 especially, did that strategy become problematic. And it really became very evident in the last uh, two generations or so, maybe the last 50 years, let's say, where suddenly we became very big and now the earth looks very small indeed. So suddenly it all flipped around. Humans are bigger than the planet if you look at our, some of our total activities. Well, how did that happen? How do we go for 300,000 generations living one way and suddenly in two, we're living an entirely different way than anyone has ever lived before? How did that happen? Well, it happened for two you know, really fundamental reasons. Uh, one, of course, is a lot more of us on the planet today. If we look at the number of human beings living on the planet of global population, my clicker is not working. What is going on here? Okay, it's just stubborn. Now it's working, yeah. I said to press it 10 times, so we'll work on that. <laughs> Uh, but what we see here is human numbers were in the you know, very low hundreds of millions, uh, if that, throughout human history. And we first reached the first half billion in the late 15th century, the first billion in the late 18th century. So it took all of human history until the late 18th century to reach just one billion. Then by the early 20th century, we reached two billion. And then between now and then, we now have reached over seven billion since about 1940. Uh, that's incredible. So we just lived through the biggest explosion of human population ever in all of human history. Happened during the lifetime of most of us in this room. So that's one thing that's you know really big. We got bigger in numbers, of course, during the very last 50 years or so, more than any other time in history. The other thing that's undeniably true though, of course, is the human, you know the hell with it, this clicker's not working. Um, the other thing that's changed a lot, of course, isn't just human numbers, it's our technology, the power we have to shape the world around us. Uh, this is a picture of what the Earth looks like at night from outer space. A lot of you meteorologists have seen this before uh, from the DMSP satellite. Uh, this is a picture of the nighttime lights of the Earth, and you can very quickly see features of our planet uh, showing human activity. And there's no lines or boundaries or names in this map, but you very quickly can see, hey, there's Japan, there's India, there's Saudi Arabia, hey, there's South Korea. Korea. And, oh, there's not North Korea right there. Uh, oh, that's that's Kim's house uh, right there. The one with the light. Well, probably shouldn't make fun of a guy with a nuclear weapon, but you know we do it anyway. Just don't put that on Twitter, okay? <laughs> you know, Trump does enough of that for us. Um, but what we see here is you know not only did our numbers increase, the power we have of a, as a civilization has increased dramatically too. Uh, we've literally changed the way the Earth looks like from outer space, and basically the same amount of time. So we grew in. Numbers, but we also grew in resource use and the ability to shape the world around us quite dramatically in a short amount of time. Uh, and if you think about it, in the last 50 years or so, we've seen an incredible explosion of global activity that has reshaped our world so much. In the last 50 years or so, and I just turned 50 a couple weeks ago, uh, just during that time, a lot of things have changed. Uh, the population of our planet about doubled, increased by 2.2 times in 50 years. But the economy grew far more, about eight and a half fold during the same time. So we've got twice as many people doing about eight times more stuff if you adjust for inflation and purchasing power. So that's a lot, that's a huge change in human activity. It changed also our use of natural resources and our impact on the environment. Food uh, demand increased by about a factor of three, water by about a factor of two, and energy by a factor of three to three and a half, based just on fossil fuels. So what's really extraordinary about this is in the last 50 years, we've changed you know, not only more than any other period in human history, we changed more than all human history and human evolution combined in a single lifetime. No wonder things are complicated. No wonder the world seems out of sorts because we've rewritten all the history books and then some by you know, a factor of two or more just during our own lifetime. 
So that's a really extraordinary change. And that, believe, I believe, is really the root of our problem today is we've, we have no history guide anymore. The way we've lived on this planet forever is now fundamentally, fundamentally different today than it was even a generation or two ago. And this, whether we like it or not, represents an inflection point in the history of our species, the history of our civilization. Everything is changing. Uh, even the way we're changing is changing right now more than any other time. So that really presents an unbelievable challenge to our species, but I, I also believe an incredible opportunity for us to seize that moment and change those second derivatives, if you will, and head them into the right direction instead of one that leads to the abyss. So that's kind of where we are today. Now, along the way, there have been some things that are pretty terrible. Along this inflection point, we have degraded quite seriously key parts of our biosphere, fundamental parts of how the planet as a whole works. Not just local environmental issues, but at a planetary scale. Certainly been happening for the last couple of decades. In some cases, maybe going back to the early dawns of agriculture, we might think, but clearly in the last century, in the last few decades, we have started to massively degrade environmental systems. And by doing so, we're burdening future generations. We're leaving them an impoverished world, a world that is less rich, less secure, less stable than the ones we inherited from our ancestors. Well, so in what ways are we doing this? Well, one way, of course, is how we're changing the world's landscapes. Uh, this is a uh, deforested landscape in Indonesia where rainforests are being wiped out for palm oil, a major commodity mainly used in India and China today as a cooking fuel, cooking oil. Uh, but this is wiping out huge areas of rainforest, including some of the most biodiverse forests on the planet, which also happen to be massive stores of carbon from the atmosphere. When you burn these, it's like burning a lot of coal, and you release that carbon that was in the wood into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. So deforestation is kind of a doubly bad thing. It loses biodiversity, but it also significantly contributes to climate change as well. Kind of a double whammy from this. So this is happening, of course, all over the planet. And if we look uh, more locally here in Latin America, this is in, um, in the Brazilian Amazon, we can see rainforest from a satellite image in 1975 where you have a pretty, um, excuse me, a fairly pristine rainforest here in the 70s and with one road through it right here, but you come back to the same place in the early 2000s and with the same kind of camera, and you see a remarkable change here. This one little rancher all by himself here in the 70s listening to disco music or whatever, now has a whole bunch of neighbors, and they're all growing soybeans today. And those soybeans are not being shipped here or Brazil or Bolivia, they're being shipped to China, being mainly fed to pigs. As people in China have gotten much richer, so has their appetite for pork, and so has pig and pork production in China. And they have nowhere near enough animal feed grown in China to satisfy that. So most of the animal feed being sent to China today comes from the United States and Brazil. So um, we import their manufacturing and we export our agriculture to China. So globalization, the fact that China is getting richer is clearing rainforest in the Amazon today. That's how interconnected we are and how tightly bound this planet really is. So we see how we're clearing lands at the local scale in Indonesia, here in Brazil. But uh, land use from agriculture is a truly awesome and extraordinary thing. Uh, this is a map of every farm in the world. Uh, I built this one as uh, actually here, uh, the University of Wisconsin with my former student Naveen Ramankuri. Uh, we used satellite data and census data from economists on the ground and mapped every farm in the world. The green areas are where we grow crops. Uh, like, you know, wheat and corn and soybeans and cassava and carrots and carob and all that kind of good stuff. If you put all that area together, it's bigger than South America. We have a South America's worth of land where we plow up to grow crops every year. The browner areas, the reddish and brown colors, are where we grow animals. These are our pastures and rangelands, and those cover about 34 million square kilometers. You put that all in one place, it's bigger than Africa. And that's where we have grazing land, where we have cattle, but also sheep and goats and all the rest. So that's the kind of bread baskets and the uh, meat baskets of the world. Uh, nothing else uses more land or changed our planet more than agriculture. It just the food footprint of our planet is about 35 to 40 percent of all the land on Earth. Uh, this rivals the changes we saw to this planet at the end of the last ice age to now. Uh, this is extraordinary. All the world's cities, by the way, are less than 1% of Earth's land. 
even though we have to drive through them and they're kind of a pain to get through, uh, they're very small. For every one acre of urban areas in the world, there are about 60 acres of agriculture. That's how big the food footprint is. To first approximation, we use half the planet. To first approximation, it's for food. That's amazing. So we use a planet's worth of land already. What's left, by the way, are the places you probably couldn't grow many crops anyway. The boreal forest in the Arctic in the north, the great deserts of the subtropics, and the one last frontier, virgin tropical forest in the Amazon, the Congo, and the Indonesian archipelago over there. That's why we're so worried about those places getting wiped out, contributing to climate change, but also species losses. So land use is a big, big deal, and most of it's from food. We're also, though, of course, using enormous amounts of water across the planet, uh, massively changing water resources through our direct manipulation of water, let alone through secondary climate changes. Uh, here is a picture of uh, what is uh, basically, this is iceberg lettuce being grown outside of Phoenix. This is a picture taken out of an airplane window landing in Phoenix. Look it out the window. We're growing iceberg lettuce in the deserts, irrigating it like this. And the water for this comes from the Colorado River. Uh, as you probably know, the Colorado doesn't really go to the ocean anymore. Uh, in fact, it's basically dried up because we used so much of it. We consumed most of the Colorado River to do things like this or irrigate places like Las Vegas. But that's not a uniquely American phenomenon. A lot of places manipulate water at massive scales to change the nature of our land surface. Uh, this is a good example from the former Soviet Union, the, uh, the Aral Sea. Uh, this is in Central Asia. Um, remember your, your globes and stuff like that? This is now Kazakhstan up here, Uzbekistan down here in the former USSR. And uh, it's a dry place. This is in the middle of Central Asia. It's fairly arid. You see all that sand around there? That, that's desert, basically. And the only reason there's a sea here is because it's being fed by two rivers. There's one here and another one over there. And they're draining uh, mountains way over to the east, over towards China, where there's snow. The snow falls here, it melts, drains down, and fills this big bowl of sand with water. Well, during the 60s, a little bit, and in the 70s and 80s especially, they, the Soviets started to dam up those rivers, use the water to irrigate the Kazakh desert, just like we do in California and Arizona, irrigate the desert to grow stuff. In this case, they were growing cotton. Uh, mainly to ship to international markets to bring in foreign currency into the then Soviet economy. Uh, so we're growing cotton in the desert and we're using the water that feeds the Aral Sea. Well, what do you think happened to the Aral Sea if you, you know, diverted its water supply? What do you think will happen? Yeah, it dries up. This is what happens. Uh, that's the Aral Sea today. Uh, and, you know, this is not like Lake Mendota or something like that. This is about 250 miles across, okay? Uh, this is not like, you know, people over here are not just worried about their, their summer cabins. I mean, this is like, you know, be like Lake Michigan just moving to Ohio or something. This is a big, big deal. It's probably the biggest change in water resources our planet's seen in thousands of years. And we did that in a couple of decades to grow cotton in the desert. Uh, one of my grad students actually had a t-shirt printed up with these pictures on it and said, we drained the Aral Sea and all I got was this lousy cotton t-shirt. <laughs> and uh, we were at a conference with a bunch of agricultural companies, including the Cotton Limited, Cotton Incorporated people. They were really ticked off. <laughs> anyway, so you gotta have a sense of humor, I guess. But um, so our use of water, mainly to grow food, 70% of the water used on this planet by people is used to do one thing, grow food. 20% for industry, only 10% is used in cities and homes. And of that, half of it's just for flushing toilets and cleaning our homes. So food, by far and away, is the biggest use of water. And this is an example of how we use it rather poorly today. But water resources are collapsing all over the world, mainly because of irrigation and unsustainable water use. Whether it's our Ogallala Aquifer in the Great Plains, or the Colorado River in the West, or the Sierra's water in California, we're seeing really big issues with water, even as climate change is just beginning to show up, and it's only gonna get worse if we don't figure out how to use water more sustainably in a more resilient way, and this is a really bad way to do it. So we're seeing that we've changed a planet's worth of land, we're changing a planet's worth of water. Now I know a lot of you have connections to like meteorology and climate and uh, atmospheric science here, so I don't need to convince you of this. We're also changing a planet's worth of air. You know, we've kind of degraded the atmosphere as well. But you know, a lot of folks still have a hard time kind of accepting that fact, and I, I kind of think I get why, because we don't see it. CO2 is an invisible pollution. By definition, our eyes don't see that wavelength that it absorbs light in. So we don't see it, and we're just dumping pollution into the air, and it's invisible. 
And also, you know, the atmosphere is kind of a funny thing. Um, for millions of years, and well, certainly thousands of years, our ancestors, we put the gods in the sky. That was where the gods lived. How, how do we dare change that? How do we even imagine changing the atmosphere when it, you know, is essentially infinite? This is the place where, you know, um, everything uh, above us would go. But in fact, sorry, my uh, clicker is really acting strange today. Uh, but the atmosphere is not infinite. It is not unchangeable. It's a very shallow little layer of gas. In fact, you know, the lower atmosphere, the troposphere, is about 10 kilometers thick, about six miles or so. And that's where the working end of the atmosphere is, basically. That's where all of our oxygen comes from. That's where all of our water comes from. That's where our weather happens, our climate. Even our food begins there, because that's where CO2 for photosynthesis begins. So everything we live and depend on happens in a six mile layer of air. Now, I live in San Francisco, and San Francisco is about, about the same size as Madison. It's about six miles across. You can drive across San Francisco, and you're not in outer space. Well, you might feel like it sometimes. You end up in Berkeley or something, but you're not. You just moved a little bit horizontally, but you go six miles straight up. It's a whole different planet. So we did change that, and we know we changed it because, uh, you know, we can measure this. We see that one of the gases in the atmosphere, CO2, has increased by about 50 percent just from the industrial era. Uh, when I was a student, this is, you know, 310 parts per million. Today, it's 410 parts per million. You know, that, that's a big change in a few years. And it's increasing uh, quite dramatically. The point here is that we're pushing the planet to its limits in lots of different ways. Land, biodiversity, water, chemistry, and even climate. And that's not even a complete list. We have changed dramatically so much of this planet. It's a really, really big deal. It's an incredible, incredible challenge because the things we depend on are our food, our water, our natural resources are becoming more scarce, more contested, and less resilient. At the same time, we're rewriting the rules of the atmosphere so that you know these 100-year events, 500-year events seem to be happening every other day around here now. And so everything we build for infrastructure under one set of climate norms is now inappropriate for a shifting climate into a whole new era. So those black swans are coming in big flocks now in a way that really could be quite dangerous for us. So we're changing the planet. It's an incredible challenge and so on. Have I depressed you yet, by the way? Is this kind of depressing? Good, good. That's part of our job. You know, like we don't get points in, uh, you know, as environmental scientists until we like really scare the hell out of people. That's, that's part of the job. But I realized that after a while, I kept on doing this and I realized I'm not getting invited to parties anymore. You know, <laughs> did you notice this yet either? You know, so um, I wanted to point out that, yes, while some things are getting a lot more challenging, uh, we're living in this Dickensian time of, yes, it's the worst of times, but in some ways, it's also the best of times. A lot of things are getting better at the same time we're degrading the planet. A lot of things are getting better at the same time, at least for people alive today, especially people who are wealthier alive today. We're doing better than about anybody in human history. Let me tell you why. Well, a lot of things have changed in the last 50 years that have provided enormous opportunities for our species. Uh, the human condition in almost every measurable way has increased dramatically. 50 years ago, global life expectancy was 55 years. Today, it's a little over 70. The biggest increase in human history in only 50 years. Incredible. Uh, women today have two and a half children across the world on average. 50 years ago, it was over five, dropping total fertility rates in half in two generations. That's never happened before. We're also seeing people with far more literacy. In 1900, literacy rates in the world were 15%. In 1965, they were about, you know, up here about 50%. Today, they're over 85%. That's incredible. So, you know, far more literate kind of population. I don't know if this is good or not, but we're now an urban species. A little over half the population today lives in a metropolitan area. That's new. That's never happened before either. And if you believe Steven Pinker, and people debate this, but I think there's a pretty good body of evidence that suggests that we are living in a time that even though it seems like we're more violent and more contentious, the actual rates of mortality and morbidity and, and danger from warfare and violence are at their lowest in human history. So we're more peaceful, we're more urban, we're far more educated, we live longer lives with smaller families, with more human rights, more uh, democracy than any other time in human history. Far from perfect, believe me. But we have made some real progress since the Middle Ages and since our past. So we have a few things to be hopeful about. At the same time, some things look a little bit scary. 
So during this time, we've seen a huge change from a world that has gotten safer, secure, and better while we're degrading the things we ultimately depend on. And that's kind of the paradox. So people ask me this all the time, you know, which is it? Are we living in a planetary crisis? Is the world just going to hell and things are just gonna get really bad? Or is this an incredible moment of opportunity? Which one is it? I, you know, I get asked this a lot. I bet you get asked the same question. It's this weird time, right? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Is the glass half full, half empty? You know, which one is it? Well, after a while, I've decided here's my answer. It's like, well, which one do you want? Because they're both possible. They're both true now, but which one dominates? Which one wins is up to you. So if you want the world to go to hell, keep doing what we're doing. But if you want it to be better, we still have the power to do that too. Which of these narratives wins is totally within our control. Which one will it be? You get to decide that. We get to decide that. And that's gonna be the question of our generation. Which one do we decide? Because I strongly believe, and this could be the, the thesis for the rest of my talk tonight, is that we still have a window of opportunity to build the future we want. That opportunity still exists. Not for a lot longer. Some things are gonna get out of control pretty soon if we don't start to stem them but we still have a window of opportunity where we can change all of those things, energy, food, water, how we live on this planet, so that we really live in a better human condition and can continue to do so into the future. But that window's closing if we don't act sooner. The sooner we act, the better our chances are of pulling it off. But we do have to act. So which one will it be? You decide, and that's what the one we're gonna have. So how are we gonna get there? Well, to build a better civilization that lives in a different way than 300,000 generations before us did, and we can't just grow, grow, grow our population, our resource consumption, our technology, our impact. We're running out of planet. We can't do anymore. We basically have used the planet to do it. We can't grow that anymore sustainably. So we need a different approach. We've got to try a different way of running a civilization that promotes human welfare while gr dramatically reducing planetary impact. Well, what are we going to do? Well, we throw out this word, we call it sustainability. Uh, this is the word we use a lot in academic circles and policy circles, environmental world and so on. A sustainable world, sustainability, everybody says this word. Uh, I've got a confession to make. I hate this word with a bloody passion. It, it's a terrible word. I mean, how uninspiring is this? If I were to ask you like, hey, how's your marriage? You'd be like, oh, it's sustainable. <laughs> like oh man I'm so sorry that sucks you know like you know that's terrible you know I mean like oh well we can basically maintain the status quo indefinitely if we sacrifice a lot like oh that's yay sign me up for that you know no no that's no good uh, we don't have a word for this what's so funny is this word was invented in the 20th century in our in the etymology of the English language there's no word for how do we maintain a thriving civilization without destroying it we never had to invent the word uh, in German, I don't speak German, I know a few of you do, being Wisconsin after all. Um, there's, a, what's the German word for sustainability? It's like Mikalkeheit or something? It roughly translate is to pasteurize. So in German, it's like, okay, let us boil it so it is preserved and doesn't go bad in the future. They, they didn't have a word either. And uh, nobody did, in most of the Western languages, there's no word for how do we keep civilization going without ruining it. Um, well, well, maybe we've got to come up with one. So if any of you are like marketing majors or you know people who do that, please help us because this, this is terrible. Nobody signs up for this. This isn't make America great again. It's like sustainable development goals within the 20, I mean, no, no, it doesn't work. This never wins on a bumper sticker. So we need to change this. And I, I know what I want to say, but I don't know how to say it in just a simple word. But wouldn't it be great if we had a word for, hey, what we really want is people in nature to thrive together, wouldn't that be nice? And we ought to be able to do it, you know, how about we do it now and be able to keep doing it in the future? Wouldn't that be great? Uh, I just don't know a one, you know, two syllable word for that that fits in a bumper sticker, but if you do, uh, I'd love to hear it from you, that'd be awesome. So we have this idea of sustainability, even though it's kind of a lame word. And what we need is we need to find solutions to get us to a sustainable future. We gotta get there, stop talking about it. How do we actually do it? So what I wanna to talk to you about in the next you know, bunch of minutes here is like, how do we build that sustainable world? We're gonna need all sorts of tools. We're gonna need good science 
and technology and better market tools and policies and all these kinds of things to get us to a sustainable future. A lot of you are working on the front lines of this stuff, especially in the science end of the spectrum and maybe tech, but we also need new business models, new ways of deploying capital, new financial instruments. We need new kinds of policies from, you know, whether it's local to international and whatever. Uh, we need all of it. There's no silver bullet here, but there's a lot of silver buckshot we can find and we're gonna need it all. But what I wanna to talk to you about today is we also need the human angle to get us there. It's very hard to get to a better future if you can't envision it. Uh, if we can't even envision a better future together, there's no way we're gonna build it. So how do we share a common goal, a common vision, an aspiration, a humanitarian mission, if you will, to leave a better world for future generations, like the compact every generation before ours had for us? that they would do the work and sacrifice maybe just a little so that they can ensure the next generation lived better than they did. How do we ensure that we continue that compact, that goal that every generation has had before us? To do that, we need a vision. We need an ideal to strive for. We need a North Star to paint our ships toward and sail off into that horizon. And we just don't seem to have it today. So how do we build that vision? Is it a vision that builds on a common dream? We, we've had these before. We've unified around dreams, even when they're uncomfortable, whether they're dreams that called us to recognize our flaws and the ugly side of humanity, but also to aspire to be better than we were before, to recognize that we were less than perfect, but we could be better creatures tomorrow. Or is it to pull together and to share our future and not ask what is in it for us, but rather what can we give to all uh, when our country is unified around a great common cause? We as Americans have strived and done this again and again. When our backs were against the wall, we usually can pull together and find a way to share a dream, share a common vision, a common goal, a better future for all. But today I worry that instead of a better common dream, we seem to have a more fragmented nightmare that the best leaders we have today are painting awful pictures of the future. And we're left not to just dispute the debate, but we're debating about which nightmare is better. This is what we're left with today. This is our best leadership. This is the best we've got is arguing about how, which version of terrible we're going to be. But that's what we've left with, unfortunately. And that's kind of difficult. And so politi I hate to say this, but politicians and media organizations are deliberately doing this to us. Americans today are more afraid, more anxious, and more divided since than we've ever been since the Civil War. The Civil War people. And we're not at war. No one's attacking us but ourselves. And we're letting this happen. We're letting ourselves be manipulated and having fear and division instilled upon us because some people want to use it for money, votes, and power. And this is dangerous. To me, this is the most limiting factor to a sustainable future, is the lack of a common vision and allowing division, divisiveness, and fear stop us. The reason this is so dangerous is if we're polarized and we're hopeless, it doesn't matter what the science does or the technology does, or the markets do, or policies, if we can't even talk to each other, if we're afraid of each other, if we can't even come together around the simplest things, how the heck can we implement rational policy? How the heck can we use better technologies if we can't even be civil? So the biggest barrier, I believe now, to getting to that better future isn't just the science and the technology. Goodness knows we need that. It isn't just markets and technology. We need that too, and better policy, all of it. But the thing that limits us most is culture, more than anything else. I really do believe that. And until we address that problem, look at square in the eye and says, if we can't be civil, if we can't have a little bit of hope and civility and less division amongst us, how can we get to that better world together when we can't even live here together? That's a really important thing. And I think in the sustainability community, we have to address this, not just science and technology and markets and policy, it's humanities that dominate the question more than anything else today. So I'm gonna posit here that you know we can build a better future. I honestly totally believe that, but just inventing another technology, writing another paper, or finding another policy that the legislature can debate forever, that's not gonna get us there alone unless we can come together and envision a common future where we can live together in a civil manner. We have to do that too. Otherwise, none of the rest of the stuff will ever, ever happen. So how do we get there? Well, we need new approaches 
to kind of pulling together and new messages to get us there. So let me just tell you a little bit about that, how we need to build that vision with new approaches and new messages. Uh, the new approaches we need to communicating to each other and sharing this common vision are really pretty important. First of all, we gotta stop, we gotta avoid the extremes in this conversation. Uh, too often when we talk of things like, uh, let's say climate change, we're speaking to two extremist groups, at least compared to the rest of the country. You might not like that because you might find yourself in one of those groups. I sometimes do. But Americans basically debate climate change at the extremes. We have one group that's about 15, 16% of the country that we might call alarmed. This is the so-called Six Americas analysis out of Yale every year. It finds there are not two kinds of reactions to climate change, like red states and blue states. Most of the country is purple. Uh, there's actually about six different reactions to the idea of climate change. One group, 16% are alarmed. They're not only convinced it's happening, they're terrified of it. They're seeing drowning polar bears every day in their minds, collapsing icebergs, hurricanes, fires, Al Gore, Leo DiCaprio, Bill McKibb, you know, they, they are hook, line, and sinker, totally convinced and scared. Fear is motivating this. This is where environmental groups mainly are, where donors and activists and everybody is. And 99% of the climate change messaging is for that audience. And that's because it's generating donations and activists. Unfortunately, those messages piss off that group, which is about 13%. This is the, well, let's call it the Rush Limbaugh audience. Uh, these are folks who are not only dismissive of climate change, they believe it's a conspiracy designed to hurt them. It's a conspiracy of George Soros, uh, academics, you know, the, the, the Chinese, you know, whoever, UN, Hillary Clinton, you name it. Uh, you know, this is quite laughable to most of us saying, wow, you really imagine a bunch of academics are pulling off a global conspiracy? Really? You think we could do that? Have you ever been to a faculty meeting? I mean, <laughs> seriously, this is pretty cool. Um, and we've been doing it for almost 200 years by just slowly messing with thermometers. That's brilliant. Why did we think of that? And what are we doing it for? Oh, to get research grants? Have you ever tried to get a research grant? I mean, really? You know, the university takes a third and the rest go to grad students. I mean, you know, really? We're doing, wow, we're really, really good at this and terrible at it at the same time. But there's an honest belief this is not only not true, it's a conspiracy. The problem is these two polls dominate like 90% of the conversation, yet they're only about 30% of the audience. The real audience is in the middle. This is the people who are still persuadable. Oops, sorry about that. This thing keeps on going on me. Uh, what we see in the middle is four other groups, kind of America's two, three, four, and five, who are concerned, but it's not their top issue, or they're cautious. Well, maybe climate change is real, but I, you know, I gotta pay my mortgage, or disengage, like I, I don't care or doubtful, like, I don't know if it's true, but I'd, I'd be willing to listen, whatever. That's the audience you wanna to get to. The problem is you don't wanna use fear to get to them, because it doesn't work. Showing them drowning polar bears, fires, hurricanes, all that just makes them scared. They're hiding under their beds, disengaging, and thinking of something else and turning on Netflix, okay? That's most of the country. Instead of fear, we have to use hope. We have to try a different approach to speak to that middle, and that's where 70% of the country is. That's where you win. Unfortunately, we're debating that 16% versus that 13, and it's just not gonna work. So we need to kind of you know, avoid the extremes. We've done it, you're preaching to the choir. The choir needs preaching too, but you also gotta to go to the rest of the church. And we haven't done that very well yet. We also need to speak to that middle. Again, that group in the middle, that's the audience we want. And we've gotta use new messages. I've already alluded to this, but to get to that middle, we have to stop using fear and all these kinds of things. We have to use hope. If people don't believe there's at least a chance of a better future, they're not gonna fight for it. They're not gonna work for it and they're not gonna pay for it. So, and I don't mean hope in the blind optimist sense, by the way, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be very clear here. Hope is a verb. Optimism is a noun. Hope requires action, it requires you to do something. It requires you to look a problem in the eye, knowing you may not succeed, you may fail, but you get up and do it anyway, because you know it's the right thing to do. Uh, it isn't blind optimism, the market somehow will solve it, or technology will somehow solve it by itself. It, that's the invisible hands. I don't believe in invisible hands. I think the hands that are gonna make the world better are yours and mine, and it's hope, is people getting up and getting to work and trying to change the world. So don't think hope is like blind faith. It's the act of getting up in the morning and trying. So that's what we gotta do, and I think people will get inspired by that if we use that kind of message. We also, and here I'm speaking to scientists, including myself, We've gotta stop talking about the problems of the environment and start talking about solutions. 
I hate to tell you this, but you know, we scientists use this idea of the science deficit model. Like people will get concerned about climate change if I explain it to them again, 105 times. No, they heard you the first 104. They just don't like you. That's the problem. People don't like it when they're lectured at and told things that you know they already knew. So we don't need to explain what CO2 is, what a greenhouse effect is. Americans have heard it. They just don't want to hear it because they don't really like you or believe you, and they don't want to. It's really inconvenient. But if you instead talk about like solar panels or manure digesters or windmills, things that create jobs in Wisconsin that help the economy, help your town and solve this problem, hey, they're on board right away. They want to talk to you today, and that's fantastic. So shift the conversation. You don't get debates about solar panels so much, but you do about the existence of you know, uh, CO2 in the atmosphere and whether it traps heat. So start talking about the problem, go to the solutions, you'll win a lot more. So hope over fear, solutions over problems. And finally, try to show where there's collaboration, how people can come together, because Americans are hungry for this, instead of inciting conflict, instead of pointing fingers like they're the problem, say, well, no, wait, they're the ally. Here's who we can work together to solve this problem. And uh, Americans are hungry for getting aside from uh, polarized politics. They want bipartisanship, they want collaboration, especially that same 70% in the middle who are totally disengaged right now. They do get engaged by collaboration. Poll after poll after poll, focus group after focus group after focus group, show this and shout it loudly, but we aren't listening. We need to do better with that. So I'm gonna show you two examples of campaigns that have now been designed, or kind of efforts have been designed to use those communication tactics to shift the conversation from kind of doom and gloom, and we can't do anything, to how do we fix big environmental issues. I wanna mention two of them. Uh, one I just did in my last job, and I'll very briefly uh, mention one that I'm starting a new job on Monday uh, that I don't know much about yet, so I can only have one slide on it. But the other ones I can tell you about because I designed the first one, the second one I'm kind of joining a team already. The first one I'm going to tell you is something called Planet Vision. Uh, it was designed at the California Academy of Sciences, which is, is the third largest natural history museum in the country. It's in San Francisco. You should go visit it. It's really awesome. Uh, we built this basically a campaign with a museum exhibit, multimedia, social media, lectures. I was working on a book and all this kind of stuff called Planet Vision, the idea of solutions for a better future. We wanted to reach tens of millions of people over the next four to five years with a persuasive case like, we can build a better future and you should be involved. So we started with a vision that the biggest challenges to our world today boil down to three things. While we have lots and lots of environmental issues, a lot of the big systemic ones boil down to how we use and produce food, water, and energy. Sure, there are lots of other issues, you know, plastic straws and this and that, you know, those are important too. But if we don't fix our food, our water, and energy systems, the planetary systems of our, of our environment, will be degraded irreparably. We have to fix these. These are the absolute requirements. The others will come along. But we need desperately to solve these three problems. So we focused on those. And for each of them, we said there's about five things we need to do in food, five we need to do in water, five we need to do in energy that could get us the 80-20 rule. Like 80% 80 of the problems in food, water, and energy boil down to just these five things. Let's focus on that. So we developed what we call solutions matrices, like here's what we need to do to fix the food system, and here's who can do it. So let me show you some examples for food, water, and energy. Here are the issues in the food system. How do we feed the world? How do we continue to feed the world? And how do we make it sustainable so it doesn't wreck climate, water, and biodiversity and land? Well, there are five things we got to do around the world. We got to stop deforestation and maybe restore the lands we've cleared. We gotta close the yield gaps, making underperforming farms a little bit better so they can feed more people with the same amount of land. We gotta increase the efficiency of things like irrigation and fertilizers by orders of magnitude. We gotta also change our diets. Less meat and uh, dairy products would be very helpful. And food waste, which is crazy, 40% of all the food grown on Earth is never eaten. That would be the single biggest solution of all. Well, who can do them? We can do them in many different places. We can have solutions in our homes. You and me can do some of this. In our communities, at the level of a city or a town or a university, or at a business, a multinational, an NGO, or at the level of uh, international to uh, state to local governments and policymakers. So you can look in this matrix and say, this is where I can chip in. I can't stop deforestation in Brazil, but I can cut the food waste in my home. I can maybe shift the diets in my neighborhood a little bit by you know, having, I don't know, uh, plant-free Mondays or something, or plant-based Mondays, that'd be cool. 
Uh, but then, you know, Elon Musk can help out over here and, you know, Paul Pullman over there, Michael Bloomberg there, Francis here, you know, you name it, uh, Anna LePay over there. And suddenly you start to see a team of like, hey, I'm doing some bits in a community, others are doing it in business, other in policy making. And suddenly you start to see a team approach to solving this big problem. It looks tractable all of a sudden. We tested this again and again and again with thousands of people and people saw, ah, here's what I can do, but it's part of a larger ecosystem of activity where others are doing their thing too. So we built one for food that was based on research largely done here at UW and at the University of Minnesota. But then we built one for uh, food and then water and then for um, energy as well. And the beautiful thing is like in the energy one, we could say, here's you, but there's, there's Elon Musk. And you know, there's Pope Francis, there's Jerry Brown, there's you know, Michael Bloomberg, there's Arnold Schwarzenegger. And after a while, you're like, you know, hey, don't you wanna be on that team? And everybody, like, yeah, I think I wanna be in this. If you got Elon Musk and Pope Francis, that's an interesting team. I think I want to be on that one. It might be a little weird, but I want to be on it, you know? <laughs> and, or do you want to be on the one, uh, you know, Donald Trump and Rush Limbaugh? Well, yeah, okay. I think I want to be on that team. The smart guys are on that team. So uh, even if the politics didn't matter, but half, by the way, you know, 80% of the people I just listed were Republicans. So that's kind of interesting. So we got to show solutions, show how you can engage, but you're not alone, but we got to make it positive and we got to make it personal too. So we drill down to the personal, translating the big Uber, food, water, and energy things down to your level of activity, showing what we could do. So at the personal level for food, we mentioned just three things that really mattered. Reducing food waste. You and I can do a lot of that because we're at the end of that supply chain. We can begin to shift our diets, especially around red meat and dairy products would be helpful, feedlot beef in particular. And we can help support innovations in sustainable farms and fisheries through our purchasing decisions. That's basically what we can do. Uh, that's great, but then there's another list for business and another list for policymakers, and it just kind of came together. So let me show you a short video that explains this a little bit too. It explains it better than I can in just a couple minutes. But this is, a, a, again, a campaign we're launching this spring, and it started to reach in the hundreds of thousands of people into the millions. Uh, and let me just show you what this little video does real quick. So the thing that we found worked for that, when we, again, as scientists, we need to do experiments. The same thing in communication and persuasion. You do experiments, you try stuff, you roll it out through like a focus group or an audience to see how people react, just like any other science. So we rolled out like hundreds of iterations of that kind of storyboard before we made a video, and we found there were certain kind of key words like join us, better future, a plan. Uh, you know, those things really resonated, and it was very different than the kind of environmental messaging people were used to getting, which was kind of in the blame and shame, like, we're all gonna die, it's basically your fault, and we're kind of screwed, you know? <laughs> which one do you wanna sign up for, you know? Uh, this isn't really rocket science, this is uh, pretty basic stuff, and yet, unfortunately, we seem to fall into the doom and gloom, we're all gonna die kind of camp way too often, where again, these ideas that hope trumps fear, solutions trump problems, and collaboration trumps conflict again and again and again, and that movable 70% of the American zeitgeist. If we focus on that and you wanna win a debate, you just need to shift 5% of that 70, and that's everything. You just change the world moving five of those 70, and we haven't really done it very well until maybe we're just beginning to right now. So uh, I was really proud to lead that project for the last uh, year or so at the Cal Academy, this museum, and we're starting to share it with all the other, we're gonna give this away to every museum in the country for free. So your local museum can share that with you 
in a very trusted place in your own community. It didn't come from Al Gore or Hollywood or you know Berkeley or something. They came from your local museum. So you need a better messenger too. But another example, and uh, I'll, I'll wrap up with this in a sec, uh, as, as John Martin mentioned too, I started a new job on Monday for this thing called Project Drawdown. Uh, how many of you have heard of that? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, pretty interesting. Um, it was a book that came out about a year ago, a little after Trump was inaugurated, called Drawdown, A Comprehensive Plan to Solve the Climate Crisis, something like that. can't remember the exact title. I probably should know since I work there now. Um, and uh, so it was, well, I can pull it up. There it is, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed. Okay, that's what it's called. Uh, and it's edited by this guy named Paul Hawken, who's an amazing environmental writer. He was a business person, you know, a Smith and Hawken, the gardening tool. He founded that, then he helped start restoration hardware. He made some money in business, but he wrote a book called The Ecology of Commerce, another book called Natural Capitalism, another one called Blessed Unrest. He's like the best environmental writer probably the last half century. Uh, an amazing guy. And he asked a simple question about three or four years ago. He said, and he's not a climate scientist, he's not even a scientist at all, or an engineer or a policy wonk, he's just a really great writer and thoughtful business leader. And he was, he was sitting around with some friends, he said, you know, I wonder if we can pull it off. Do we have enough tools in our toolbox right now to solve climate change or not? And they're like, I don't know. I mean, like, well, I know about solar panels and wind and there's other stuff we can do and electric cars and something to do with agriculture, I don't know. But had anybody run the numbers to see if we added up all these solutions, are they big enough to actually address the problem or not? And if so, which ones would you start with? Which one's number one? Which one's number two? Which one's number... And he started like, I don't know, I, that's weird, I should know this. And he looked around, he started reading all the IPCC reports. He started reading all the academic literature, all the books on climate change, and no one had bothered to write this down. No one had answered this question. Do we have enough solutions and which ones are the biggest and where would you start? Nobody had even thought to do this before at all. Nobody had really written this in a comprehensive single place. So he said, well, heck with it, I'll do it. So he uh, hired a couple of uh, kind of uh, researchers to kind of help him. They spent about two years running kind of some computer models and some analysis, and they basically looked at every solution that was credible to look at what could be done about climate change and rank them from one to 100 in terms of what was the most, uh, had the highest efficacy and lowest cost. And it blew people's minds because a lot of them are not what you think they're gonna be. You know what number one was for people who didn't read the book? Anybody? What? Refrigerant. You read the book. Okay. <laughs> Nobody would get that. Well, if you did, you're a genius. Okay. You're exactly right. It's refrigerant gases, believe it or not. Uh, like, what? What do refrigerators have to do with climate change? Well, it turns out the gases we use in coolants and other kind of industrial products are called fluorinated gases. They're halo fluorocarbons, still chlorofluorocarbons. There's something called sulfur hexafluorine. All of those gases with an F in them are really good at trapping heat. They're like a super greenhouse gas. It turns out when you account for those, those um, globally, at least on a 20 year time horizon, are getting rid of those would do more to fix climate change than anything else we could do. That's number one and nobody was talking about it. One of the other top ones was food waste. What, what does that have to do with climate change? A lot, when 40% of all the resources used to grow foods thrown away with the food, including the forest was cut down, the fertilizers and energy consumed in producing it. Oh my God, uh, educating girls, helping girls empower themselves to make better reproductive decisions. Those were numbers four and five, okay? The first energy solution was number eight or nine was windmills. Solar panels don't even show up in the top 10. So, and they, the numbers are right, by the way. So this has changed in completely the conversation people were having about well, how do we fix climate change because we're leaving half the answers off the table. We're only thinking about solar panels and windmills and stuff like that. Let me tell you something. Electricity is only a tiny part of energy and energy is only a tiny part of emissions. So if you think you're solving climate change by dealing with the electricity sector alone, you're fooling yourself. It's only about 25% of global emissions. Agriculture and forestry is over 35%. It's the biggest sector. Electricity is number two, transportation is number three at 15%. So you gotta look at everything. There's no one lever for climate change. You gotta pull them all. So this book, for the first time, ranked them, listed them, and looked comprehensively, and it wasn't a bunch of scientists, it was like three people in Sausalito. And they did this, and it took off like crazy. I don't know why, but this book, probably the timing of it, it came out just after the Trump inauguration where people were feeling pretty depressed if you cared about climate change, like, oh my God, we're, nothing's gonna change. And then this book comes out and said, no, we got it. Here are 100 things we can do if we did any of the top 50, you know, we get the top 50 or so, we've more than solved the problem. All of these are available today, 
None of this is science fiction and all of it is affordable. And here's where you start. People are like, thank God. This is the best-selling environmental book uh, of the last 20 years, and it's just to about surpass The Inconvenient Truth and probably be the most best-selling environmental book of the last 50 years very soon. That's incredible, and they didn't expect that to happen. So anyway, long story short is they wrote a book, they were gonna stop and go off and write some other book, but this took off so much, donors and foundations and climate organizations said, you've gotta build an institute to permanently focus on three things, discovering, disseminating, and then deploying those solutions to climate change. And about a month ago today, they sat down with me over lunch and offered me a job, which I was not expecting. And about a week or two later, I accepted it. And about a week later, they announced it. And Monday, I start. So um, it's going to be kind of fun. But it's weird, because I went from running a place with 1,000 people to a place with five. Uh, I increased the staff by 25% by joining it, uh, which is kind of <laughs> cool. Um, it's more like a startup. But I'm actually really excited, because it's blending a little bit of science. There's a lot of science still to be done, like, which solution's better? Which greenhouse gas traps heat better, blah, blah, blah. But it's more synthesizing what the academic community's largely done already, but putting it together in one place, which is really important. The second part is communicating that science out to the larger world, which has been my full-time job for the last four or five years, which has been really fun. But most importantly, it's then kind of sharing that with uh, you know people who can put it into action, deploying it in the real world. And that's where you're gonna have to connect to businesses, to cities and states and NGOs and communities and everybody to solve this problem together. And how can the science and science communication truly serve and facilitate that conversation and that engagement to really change the world, where Drawdown becomes kind of the blueprint that like Madison could use for its climate commitment, or you know, a company like, um, I don't know, Target could use for their commitment to climate change, or California and Jerry Brown. We, we've been hearing leaders stepping up and making commitments to addressing climate change, but they don't have a plan. They say, we're gonna build a house, but there's no blueprints. Here's the blueprint, at least the first draft. We're gonna make it better, we're gonna make it available, and we're gonna make it custom for everybody who wants it and give it away. So I'm pretty excited to do that and uh, start next week, which would be pretty cool. So um, if you could help spread the word on that, that'd be great, because a lot of you knew about it, but a lot didn't. Uh, and that'd be really cool to help people kind of see, and if you wanna check it out, just go to drawdown.org, which is pretty cool. So um, I've learned over the years to uh, wrap up a talk by, you know, I've been telling you a bunch of stuff, but I wanna ask you something too. So I wanna ask a couple of things of you tonight. Uh, one of the things I want to do is, first of all, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, we need so many people involved in these conversations. Uh, the people who are like, professionally dedicated to an environmental problem, concerned citizens, teachers, community leaders, all of you all have such an important role, and places like Madison are really leading the nation when Washington isn't. Places like Madison are. And so we need you to really step up and keep doing what you're doing. Please, it's so, so important. Never been more important than now. So please keep doing that. But also, um, especially for folks like myself and we're coming out of the more science and technical and maybe policy kind of worlds, let's not dismiss the cultural aspect of this. We can come up with the smartest, coolest, best technology, the best new paper in science or nature, the best new kind of policy argued down in the legislature, but unless people like, can work together and be civil and accept new things from each other and not be so toxic, that, as I was arguing through most of my talk, is the most limiting factor to addressing our environmental problems is the divisiveness and division we see in this country today because it's stopping anything good from happening. If we don't solve that, we're not gonna get any of the other stuff done anyway. So please, uh, you know, a scientist in the room, hey, turns out we should have studied more of the humanities maybe because that's where a lot of the action is too. And we gotta embrace that and be uh, partners with folks in those social science, humanities, and fields of persuasion and cognitive psychology. We could learn a lot from those folks. And finally, um, let's make sure that we work together. We're never gonna get there just alone on these solutions. We need to collaborate and learn from everything that we all know to build that better future, to really kind of work together to do that. So um, I just want to leave you with maybe one last kind of inspiring thought, I hope, is, uh, I don't know, in times I feel a little down, I, I try to remember this quote from Robert Anton Wilson. He always said, hey, the future, it's up for grabs. I asked you at the beginning, you know, which world is it going to be? The one where the planet's going to hell or the one where humanity's getting better? And I said, well, it's up to you. And that's still true. The future we write is still one we can, that can be written. We can, you know, we can change the future. It is still at least a little bit up for grabs, even if it's just beginning to go away from our fingertips. But I firmly believe we can still grasp the future and shape it. And like he says, it belongs to any and all who take the risk and accept the responsibility of consciously creating the future they want. 
So with that, I just want to say thank you and um, thank you for having me here tonight and thank you to the Robach family for making this event possible and their generosity. And I hope we have a little time for some questions and uh, some comments. So uh, I'll be sticking around. So thank you very much and uh, look forward to your comments. Tonight. So, uh, yeah, um, do we need the mic to flow around, probably? Yeah. I want to, okay, I'm going to um, go around to people with their hands up. Thank you very much, John, for your excellent presentation. We, and we'll try and get to a number of people in, a, you know, in some sort of an order. I'm going to start with Hans. Oh, and can you try to ask a question and not have a five-minute soliloquy to that? Because that'll, yeah. that'll allow more people to ask questions. So try your best to do that. This is actually a thought rather than a question, so is that kosher or not? Keep it short. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. The Enlightenment kind of gave us the idea of uh, maximizing individual freedom, mm -hmm. being able to do what we want, and it seems to me that a contrast between two views of the world. We can say, I have a right to do what I want unless someone else can prove it harms them, in contrast to the physician's creed, first do no harm. Mm -hmm. It seems to me the world needs a lot more people who wake up in the morning and say, I need to first do no harm. I need to heal. And to me that changes the, I think that could change the conversation about all the people that are looking for proof. Yeah. Because then if you say, I don't, I don't want to do harm, then I'm going to go look. I want to know whether I'm doing harm and stop. Anyway, so I, I just think that's, that's not yep. culture or anything. That's really, that's theology. And I didn't hear you mention that. And I think that's a big, big part of what's needed here. We need to basically get to very old ideas about um, what the good life is. That's a great comment, and uh, I'll, even though it wasn't a question, I'll riff on it a little bit, can't resist. Uh, I love your point, it's, you know, it is kind of a fundamental uh, belief system, it's a, you know, kind of an epistemology of you know, who are we? Are we just individuals who do what we want, or do we care about the harm we may cause others? I, I would ask us to call upon ourselves as, you know, I'm a sucker for patriotism, even today. I still believe in the old American dream, you know, that old unwritten commandment that says, our children should do better than we did, and we should make sure of that. And my generation inherited that from my parents, and so did most of you, and so did they from their parents, and so on, and so on. But a lot of people sacrificed and bled, and some died, so we could leave healthy, free, and safe lives in this country. And that was what built us. It's not unique to America, but it is uniquely built to this country. And I still believe that. But the thing is, we've lost that somehow. So I really believe it's a hybrid of the two. It's like we maybe need to call upon the best of ourselves to remember that unwritten commandment. That, you know, we, that's the moral absolute. And if you think about what were the successful transformations of society that nobody thought would happen at first? So maybe the end of apartheid, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, gay rights and gay marriage happening so quickly in African American, none of those things were possible in the 1970s if you asked anybody, but they all were not only possible, they were inevitable because they had a moral absolute. This was simply right and this was simply wrong. And people finally realized it. And I think when we kind of think about the environment that way. This is simply wrong to leave future generations impoverished and unsecure and unhealthy. No one wants this. I've never met anybody who says, you know what, screw my kids, the hell with them, I don't care. <laughs> I've never met those people, have you? They're not there. So I think we call upon ourselves say, look, you're a good person, you believe this too, and here's how we can do it. I think we will rise to that occasion, but we aren't framing it the right way. So it's, I, I totally agree, it's about the framing of that kind of like you said, almost theological, though I hate to use that word, but a system of beliefs. Yeah, it's deep into our myth mythos. Um, Sherry, hey. John, you spent a lot of time talking about mitigation and messages. Yeah. Um, but given that, I mean, if you go back to Gaia theory and the fact mm -hmm. that um, we have now unleashed so much change in the earth that it's reacting. And so we are having these huge climate events more often, mm -hmm. um, bigger and bigger. Yep. And um, I'm just wondering at what point we go from um, spending all of our time on trying to do mitigation as opposed to 
working on resilience yeah. and mm -hmm. rebuilding in a way that we can withstand what's going to be coming at us and is coming at us now. Yeah. Um, so maybe if you want to address that, because that's another part of the situation we're in. Yeah, uh, that's a very good point. I, I clearly didn't have time or space, mental space to really address that properly. But you know, on one hand, um, well, here's the analogy, like, you know, the, the doctor is saying, you're really getting sick. Uh, we need to treat you now. Uh, and, you know, first step is stop doing the stuff that's causing your illness. Uh, the next step after that or in parallel with that, that's a necessary but now not sufficient condition. It'd be like saying to somebody like, you know, you're a heavy smoker. You're, you're smoking four packs a day and now we found a tumor in your lung. First step, stop smoking. You know, next step is the intervention to make your lungs more resilient to that. You know, and that's a bad analogy, I'm sorry, but uh, you're right, we need to do both, but I think mitigation still is job number one. And the adaptation part of this to build more resilience in our, our infrastructure, our economy, our systems, our agriculture, our communities, clearly is important too. Uh, but we haven't seen anything yet. If we don't do mitigation, the adaptation we're due for today's climate is just gonna be erased by tomorrow's and the day after that. So the adaptation is a moving target. We don't know what to adapt to if we can't mitigate, it's it's lost. So I think we need to do mitigation massively while slowly, when making sense, do adaptation. We're gonna see that in Madison, and I'm sure you know folks who live on uh, on the Isthmus are thinking a lot about the locks of the Ahara River right now and uh, where their basements are. I used to live over there, and like, oh crap, you know? <laughs> and where Lake Mendota and Lake Mendota are gonna have to argue about where we keep the lake level of Lake Mendota. Well, uh, Lake Mendota, well, that's a new normal because the climate's shifted a little bit. We didn't have to think about that when they built those locks, now you do. So every city, every community is gonna have to do that, and you're absolutely right. That's a whole other bunch of talks. Um, but right now, if we, you know, we can do adaptation, but you gotta, if we don't like stem the damage, adaptation is just a losing treadmill. We've gotta do both. Completely agree. Uh, who's next? Hey. Hi, thanks so much for your talk. Um, thanks. I am curious a little bit more about your thoughts on the politics of all of this because I'm I'm sympathetic to these claims about we need to resolve polarization and come together and mm -hmm. um, be more collaborative. But I also struggle with it because I think it's well. First, I think it's somewhat disingenuous to say that both sides of this polarization are equally responsible for putting us in the predicament we're in. And I also struggle because the examples of advances that you point to like gay rights movement or mm -hmm. the civil rights movement were not, they, those were results of real political struggle and contestation. And yeah. especially when you have a side that has moneyed interests, strong financial interests that have assets that will be stranded in a transition like this that are influencing US and global politics, mm -hmm. how, you can, how we can just say oh, we need to come together and not see struggle as a fundamental part of resolving these issues. Yeah, uh, I'm very sympathetic to what you say. I do disagree with it a little, um, just to maybe be provocative. Um, and you don't have to agree with me, you probably won't. Um, but I, I just, I think professional politics, especially the variety we have in the Beltway in DC, is never gonna help us. And frankly, we've had more action on climate change since Trump was elected than we did in the previous eight years of Obama. He didn't do anything on climate change. And it might have been an uh, overreaction or a, a massive re antigen reaction to the Trump phenomena. Jerry Brown and Michael Bloomberg have made the United States the world's leader on climate um, uh, pronouncements. I mean, we've made more. If you average California and New York and the we are still in parts of the U.S. economy, it's about 70% of the U.S. GDP. Almost all the Fortune 500s, every state that matters, every city that matters is saying, we're going to do Paris Accords. And Jerry, Bloom, uh, Jerry Brown just blew everybody away. So the entire California economy, the fifth largest economy in the world now, uh, is saying we will be totally carbon neutral, not just on electricity, on everything by 2045 in 20 something, 25 years. No country in the world has done that other than Sweden, and they're small. So just California alone and New York City alone, putting then nobody else, and if the rest of the country did nothing, we're still beating the rest of the world combined just in the US. So I say, forget Washington, don't worry. They're not doing anything anyway. So let's find the states, let's find the cities, and half of them are Republicans or more. And over the last 30 years, the biggest wins on environmental issues have, and if you go back to the Nixon administration, have happened often not when you expect. And I, I, it's weird, but I think we get bogged down in some of this politics and stuff like that. And I agree, if you want to win those America One and America Six debates, is a highly partisan kind of question. There are a lot of people who 
are not identifying with either party around the biggest demographic in America today is people who not only don't vote, they won't vote. They will never vote. They're highly educated, highly diverse, highly successful people between 20 and 45. And that group is not being spoken to by today's politics. So I, I, I hear your frustration and I agree with part of it, but that recipe has failed us for the last 40 years and especially the last 20 years and nothing is happening. The only innovations on climate change in this country are coming from anywhere but Washington. So um, practice a different kind of politics. I, I would love Washington to join us and get, get to work, but it ain't gonna happen for the next two years. So uh, let's, let's do what we can in the meantime. But I, I understand your frustration, for sure. I want to remind people, too, that we have a reception outside afterwards. So oh, yeah. that's why I won't allow any follow-up questions. I could see you were interested, and I encourage your interest. But there's an opportunity to continue the conversation outside. So I want to continue to get people later. to other questions. <laughs> so next question. I know that, that conversation's not over. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for coming, first off. And your yeah, remarks are great. Oh, why do you think the environmental issues always get framed in science as contrast from what you presented, and that's the way I've always presented the issue, yeah. it's the 300,000 generations and two generations yeah. argument and how much things have changed. Mm -hmm. Why don't we use that argument? That to me is compelling. That's my first question. Mm -hmm. my, uh, uh, it'll be quick. I promise it'll be quick. So my second question picks up on what the lady said earlier, but why not put the costs of mitigation up against the costs of prevention. So in other words, if you look at the city of Madison, what's going to have to be spent, so to speak, yeah. or, you know, all over yeah, the yeah. place, you know, to create retention abilities, et cetera, dealing with water. Yeah. Why not put that up against the cost of climate change as a, yep. what's the option? So would you comment on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer the second question probably more, um, or try to. Um, it, what's really nice about a lot of the solutions to climate change is most of them are really good for us. Um, and uh, and economics is really bizarre to me because like, you know, when you average, like the cost of doing this will be X billion dollars. I'm like, to whom? Do you and I personally benefit from, an, uh, from burning coal? I don't, do you? You do, really? You own a coal mill? Well, no, but I mean, you carry the electricity works, but is it coal or gas doesn't matter to you. It does if you're a coal miner or you own a coal company, but most people don't. So I can, Economic, I, I hate that there's a building called the Department of Economics on this campus and across the street there's called political science as if they're separate things. They're not, there's a political economy. Um, yeah, I mean, let's stop pretending there's a global average economy. There isn't, there are winners and losers. So this is why we're having these debates. So the cost of changing climate change will be borne by a few industries and most of us will not pay that cost. Most of us actually get the benefits of those solutions, like greener cities. You invest in public transit, bike lanes, greener cities. Usually for every dollar you spend, you probably make about 15, you know, which is a pretty good deal. Uh, Madison certainly has benefited from this. It's, or a green infrastructure instead of gray infrastructure for managing stormwater or water filtration. New York City and others again and again and again show this is good. So spending the right smart money on kind of preventing climate change, but also kind of adapting to a changing climate turns out to usually be a pretty good economic win. And a lot of it is like efficiency. Um, the best solutions to climate change are the don't be dumb anymore kind of things. Like why are we wasting energy in inefficient buildings? Why are we throwing 40% of the food grown on the planet away? Uh, those are crazy things. So there are very few solutions to climate change that are like really truly bad for anybody unless you're a stockholder in ExxonMobil or something, you know, and that, then that is problematic. So let's just recognize, you know, so most of them are win-wins for most folks, but you do get into power debates about who wins, who loses, and there's some losers, but a lot of winners. That's kind of why we need to frame it that way, and I, I agree. But the costs are often uh, net advantageous for everybody when you include public health, you include kind of communities, you include jobs, you include security, all those things we value. Uh, by and large, I can't think of any climate solution that makes us uh, sicker, poorer, and you know, worse off as a whole. I can't think of a one that does. Okay, maybe one last question. How are we doing? Uh, maybe two more questions. Okay, up to you. Okay. Uh, hi, John. Hey. Um, got here. I somehow I got. Okay. Sure. John, I hey. heard you speak a lot of times when you were in Madison, you know, more than ten years ago. So one reason I wanted to come tonight was uh -huh. to hear how your thinking had evolved 
And you you, <laughs> you, 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 you <laughs> yeah. mentioned it a little at the end, but I sat here th thinking all the time I was listening to you. He doesn't sound like a STEM graduate. He sounds like a liberal arts graduate. Yeah. yeah there sounds Funny like that. there's been a, an evolution there. Has there been, and can you explain that your personal evolution in thinking? Uh, well, yeah, I guess. I mean, uh, I, I am a proud graduate of the College of Letters and Sciences at the UW, um, although I was really a science nerd. Uh, so I can't say I was like really a liberal arts passionate person. I was really fascinated by the science and I kind of didn't do the rest of the liberal arts. So, but, I, you know, I woke up in a really cold sweat about four years ago when I started running a museum and realized, wait a minute, I'm not in the science business anymore. I'm not really even in the science communication business anymore. I'm in the culture business. If we can't get through people's hearts, we're never going to get to their heads especially in this fractious, polarized world. And I saw it every day. I could see people who voted for very different candidates in that last election, people who supported President Trump walking through my museum, and people who voted for Bernie Sanders and wearing their Birkenstocks in Berkeley walking through my museum. And you know what I noticed is when they're holding their kid's hand and they're looking at a coral reef, we have the biggest coral reef in the world in our museum, indoors, it's beautiful. And they're seeing all these majestic fish and creatures swimming by. They were the same people. They love their children. They want to share something beautiful and awe-inspiring with them. Fundamentally, we're the same. And it had nothing to do with the facts. If I argued to them, like, CO2 is bad and you're responsible for it, I suddenly got one and I lost the other. But when you brought together, no, we share a vision of a better world. We want our children to live in that world. We enjoy moments of awe and wonder and inspiration and beauty. We want to share those with the people we love. Fundamentally, we have so much more in common than we do separate. And so I think when we tap into that, it became much more about culture and the humanities, and I was shocked. I was kind of like, wow, it was a really, I literally woke up in a sweat, going, oh my God, for 20 years, I, I was getting it wrong in science communication. First of all, we believe in the science deficit model. If I just tell them about CO2 one more time, it's kind of like, you know, when Americans in Europe, you know, like, if I speak English louder and slower, then maybe they'll, no, they just don't like you. They understood you the first time. It's kind of like scientists. I think we're doing the same thing a little bit. I will just lecture you again. And I, people here are much better than that, but a lot of us, I, I, I wasn't very good at that for a long time. But if you kind of tap into people's hearts and aspirations, we find out we're actually a lot more alike than we thought. Everybody loves their kids. Everybody wants the world to be better. Start there, and that's a cultural argument. And the most, I have a Jesuit priest friend of mine who tells me the most important real estate in the universe is the 18 inches from the human heart to the human brain. And they're right. That's where you start, that's where you end up. If you try going here first, you're not going anywhere. So uh, yeah, I guess uh, I ended up being a liberal arts student after all. It took me 30 years. But. John, do you have time for two more short questions? I'm, I'm all yours, dude. Okay. <laughs> Whatever you want. Hey. Yep. Just by chance, <clears throat> I bought your book a week ago. Well, I didn't write it. it was, the people were there before, but it's yeah. wonderful bedtime reading, short chapters and gorgeous pictures. So, okay, <laughs> that is inspiring. Um, Thanks. A question: um, Ruth Benedict uh, starts her great uh, work with "Man as a Creature of Culture," in the, wrote that in the early 20th century about the American Indians. Okay. Um, our own John R. Commons, uh, a labor economist from here, that use the same kind of thinking to create the foundation for our electric power industry that lasted the whole 20th century. Huh. And so my question here is, is, is there a, com a, a compendium of cultural and institutional models that we can select from or you'll be selecting from to address specific issues? Uh, that we wow, that's a really good, I'm not familiar with the individuals, and I, that shows a gap in my education that I'll need to fill. So thank you for that. I'll have to go look that up. Um, I think it's a wonderful question for all of us to say, you know, like when we've been at our best, what were the instruments and, you know, kind of tools we used to come together? Uh, I think we've done that before. We, I've tried to allude to some in the past where people have stood up with kind of uh, cultural movements or institutions, things that are often in civil society uh, and have stood up and tried to bring us together around a grand challenge. Um, it, I mean, this is a simple minded argument, but it seems to me that a lot of our polarization uh, falls into a grand argument we're having as a society. Is the market the place that should solve all our problems? Or is it policy and our government that solves all our problems? It seems like that's the grand debate. I'm like, where's the third rail, or the third leg of the stool, I should say, of civil society? Where are the institutions that have played that role? Like the museums, the libraries, parks, the, uh, we used to have these grand things like called Chautauquas, where people would come together and share knowledge around a common kind of public good. Uh, they weren't governments, they weren't companies, they weren't shareholders, there were other institutions, and universities are also amongst those. 
especially those like the great state University of Wisconsin, which is a land grant school. Remember, a lot of you, a lot of you know this, but the younger folks in this room may not realize this, that we were founded in the, during well, the Morrill Act in 1862, during the height of the Civil War. President Lincoln signed the Morrill Act, which created the great state universities of the land grant schools like Wisconsin. What a bold experiment, the idea, let's create institutions of higher learning and knowledge that explicitly are to be shared with everyone of your citizenry, of your state, and to share the knowledge around, not just time, things like agriculture and forestry and mining and ranching and things, like, but let's help build the, what we call here the Wisconsin idea. Secret in Minnesota, they call it the Minnesota idea. In Penn State, they call it the Pennsylvania idea. We didn't invent it here, but you can call it whatever you want. It's a great idea. But imagine that. We did this during the height of the Civil War. We built some of the most important institutions in American history. So I, I think it's a great question. It's like, you know, what were the things that could bring us together? What's worked in the past? And I think you're in one of them. Uh, what else do we need? Um, what can we rise to if we put our minds to it? Yeah. I was Oh, th thank you so much um, yes, for your talk. And I, I wanted to ask a follow-up question about the drawdown and the um, work with Planet Vision. Yeah. I, um, the question was, um, could you speak please about some of the cultural and technical changes needed to reduce the impacts from flying, which for, um, which as I understand is a big contributor to greenhouse gases and for many folks, including me, um, probably my largest contributor to <laughs> To, to climate change, but not, not only on a personal level, but also on a systemic and cultural level, please. Thank you. Uh, years ago when I was still here, I, I did one of these, like, I think a lot of people do these like personal carbon footprint things, and I was horrified to find my biggest part of my footprint by far was flying to meetings talking about climate change, uh, way more than heating and transportation electricity. And it's time we kind of looked in the mirror and kind of figured that out. Uh, technical changes you mentioned, um, few, uh, long haul flight efficiency has increased by about a factor of two since the 1980s. Um, I forget the exact number, it used to be on a long haul flight, like across the country or beyond. Uh, most of the fuel in flying, by the way, is in takeoff and landing. So, you know, a 500 mile flight is not that much different than a 2000 mile flight. So you might, if you're going long distance, flying is better than short distances in some ways. Anyway, uh, it used to be, if I got the numbers right, it used to be you'd get, if you fill, the average passenger was getting about 18 miles per gallon uh, equivalent of driving by flying somewhere. Today it's over 40. Uh, so, you know, you're better than, you know, that's pretty good. Partly because the airlines have got to get, their margins have gotten smaller, they've had to get more efficient, their planes are getting lighter, they're getting better fuel efficiency in the, their own engines, but also you notice there's no empty seats on planes anymore and your knees are up to your chin now, basically. Every cubic inch of a plane is being optimized for this. Scheduling, you know, like they've gotten very, very good at this and that's just markets and technology. Good but they're probably in the diminishing part of that curve at some point. I don't think they can double it again without some revolution. Uh, second technological problem, the issue is a barrier. It's very hard to imagine electric planes. Uh, I don't know how we're gonna electrify flight. Uh, that's very challenging. The weight of batteries compared to the lift required to keep the batteries going, it's a losing physics problem right now. Unless you have, I don't know, nanocapacitors or something much lighter than lithium batteries. So who knows? Uh, but right now we're still looking at liquid fuels. So we could use biofuels, you know, algae-based kind, of, um, kind of replacements for petroleum-based jet fuel. Maybe places like Wisconsin, Illinois, and others probably are working on that, but nobody's had the big breakthrough yet. Culturally, uh, yeah, um, personally, I don't know. I'd hate to give up like travel that enriches your soul, like a great vacation to Italy to see art, you know, pretty cool. Flying to Washington to go yet another committee meeting. I could ditch that one in a heartbeat. So uh, I don't know, uh, I, I can't speak to anybody else here, but I think, you know, video conferencing, if we can get really good video conferencing, can we cut off at least a lot of the crappy travel we didn't want to do in the first place? That'd be pretty nice, but I'd hate to start with the, you know, taking your kid to a beautiful place, you know? I don't know, uh, but we're gonna have to get better about that, but um, I'll know, you didn't ask this question, but I'll wrap up with this a little bit, because I think it's important. One of the first steps, I talk about culture, there's another step that I didn't talk about. Uh, a lot of us feel a little twinge or a big twinge of guilt on this issue, like, oh God, my flying is contributing to this, or my car, or my house, my, you know. And the problem with guilt is it paralyzes people by and large. A lot of people, when they feel a twinge of guilt, deflect away from it. They don't want to look at it and like, oh, yeah, 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 and ignore it. Uh, I've been talking to a bunch of psychologists lately and they said, actually, the first thing we need to do is give ourselves a little bit of forgiveness. Like, say, hey, you didn't invent that kind of airplane. It's not your fault, Susan, it's cool. 
You know, like you inherited this technological civilization. Here we are. Here we're, now, your job is to make it a little better. That's noble, but forgive, you know, the past. You weren't part of that. Nobody here invented the coal power plant. Nobody here, you know, tried to lie to Congress about climate change. Nobody here was part of that kind of, you know, you're off the hook a little bit, but be part of the solution. So I think when people kind of forgive themselves a little bit, and I see this a lot in airplanes, people feeling really guilty flying places. Well, okay, but is that constructive? Or is it constructive to say, how do we make it better? So that's probably where I'd start. Is a act, small act of forgiveness and a big dose of let's make it better. Okay. Thank you again, John. Our, our reception will be out this door to the left, so please join us for refreshments and further conversation. Let's give John one last round of applause, Thank please. You. And all are welcome to our reception.